I'm going to be doing a series on how to program for video game developers and for people who are new to video game development and to programming. And before we actually jump into programming specifically for video games, I wanted to do a series on just basic programming concepts. Um, just the basic ideas of uh, programming and what goes into it. Uh, so this is the first video in just an intro to programming, just how to program. Um, and today we're going to cover uh, this list of topics. So first of all, um, the idea behind this video is not so much to teach how to program in this video specifically. This is more to introduce the concepts that go into programming. If you think about programming and learning a programming language like um, the way a person uh, learns a real spoken language, when you think about like a toddler who um, isn't able to speak yet, um, it's not only that they don't have the words to articulate what it is they want to say, but they also don't even like, they haven't yet mentally developed even the concept or the, um, you know, the idea of, hey, this is something that can be expressed in a language. Like they're just not there yet. <laughs> Learning a programming language um, or like any programming language kind of has the same thing. It's, there's two parts to it. There's learning what you can do in a programming language generally. And then along with that is how do you do that in this specific language? So when you're doing that the first time, you're learning these two things simultaneously. Uh, and that is extremely challenging <laughs> because if you're going into it thinking like, hey, I just wanna make this game or this application or whatever it is that you're interested in making, um, you just really have no idea how to express those concepts or just what even the concepts are that can be expressed. So this video today is to go through just a few of the very basic things that can be done when programming. So, uh, so the first thing here is instructions, then variables and different data types conditional statements, loops, functions, recursion, and then just the general notion of problem solving. Uh, so we're gonna go through each of those things kind of one by one. Um, so I am using Python today to go through these things. So on the left here is VS Code, and I've just got this test.py file created. So we're gonna make a few things in there. And then over here on the right, this is actually Python running right now. So in Python, um, you know, you can think of a programming language as at least including things that can be done like on a calculator. So I can go one plus one and it says two. Okay, that's good. Two plus two is four. I can also go two times two and that's four as well, you know, 530 or 327 times 538 it'll give me that number um i can do like 8 divided by 4 is 2 and we can see that uh that number is formatted a little bit differently because we did division it has 2.0 and that's actually because that's a different data type and we'll get to that a little bit later but anyway you can see that by just inputting commands and then hitting enter it sends that to Python, and then Python figures out the answer and spits it back to us. So those are just some very basic instructions that Python can execute. At the very low level, what's happening is all of these instructions are going to the processor, and the processor in our computer has an, uh, an, arithmetic, or an arithmetic logic unit uh, and it's executing these um, math equations for us. And that's an important thing to understand, and we won't go into it really, really in de detail right now, but understand that the processor has a certain set of instructions that it can execute. And 
at the end of the day, any of the various programs that we write are ultimately translated into whatever native uh, operations the processor can do. So Python is doing that dynamically. It's reading um, the instructions that we give it, and then it's translating them into the native uh, well, the native um, processor commands, the processor instructions that are needed. Then the processor executes it and spits the uh, result back out to Python. Python translates it back into something that we as people can read. Um, so it's a lot more than just math. There's also things like uh, retrieving data from memory. And so you need to have a memory address and it, you know, and it'll go through and say, okay, well, this data is stored here, so I'll go pick that out and then I'll show it to you or I'll process it or do whatever. Um, different things like that. Um, so just understand that a processor has a set of instructions Math instructions are some of them, but there's a lot more other ones. Uh, and, but a lot of it is things like moving data around and storing data somewhere. Uh, the data can be stored either to memory or it can be stored to what's called a register. And a register just allows the processor to interact with it. Um, but then also uh, you can write to special registers like uh, like your display buffer. Uh, the display buffer is how the computer actually shows things to you on your screen. Um, so at the end of the day, that's kind of like what's going on at the very, very core level of your computer. So that's some instructions. Um, now let's talk about variables. So variables are things um, if you've hopefully taken some sort of algebra course in you know middle and high school you'll be familiar with the notion of variables like x plus 3 equals 7 right and then you would have to solve for x and x here is a variable well the thing is in this it's not actually a variable in this specific equation because it has one answer and that is 4, right? 7 minus 3 is 4. And while we call that a variable, it's really just a fixed value whose uh, value is unknown. When you get into learning about like lines, where it's like y equals mx plus b, this is actually uh, a better explanation or a better conception of a variable. So the value x that changes and so m is fixed b is fixed but then this is describing the value of y as x changes so um so as x moves to the right or to the left y will either be increasing or decreasing at this rate and then here's our intercept at x equals zero um, In code, we can use variables that either um, can remain static or uh, can have a value that changes over time. So let's just say like x equals 1. All right, so now we've just told Python, hey, I want to use this value x, and for right now, I want it to have the value of 1. So if I want to know what the value of x is, I just type x, and it says it's 1. Now we can change the value. We can say x equals five. And then if I type x, it says five. The other thing we can do, we don't have to give it a hard set value. We can say, I want x to be whatever the value of x is currently plus one. So it's referring to itself and it's saying, well, right now my value is five and I want the new value of x to be whatever the old value of x is, plus one. So I hit that, and then it's six. Hopefully that was expected. And we could do x equals x times 10. So this 
um, make a quick prediction. So x is currently 6, and I'm assigning x the value of itself times 10. So hopefully you predict that the value is 60. And we can do uh, divide as well, x over 5, and that would be 12. x equals x plus 3, I don't know, and whatever. Um, so another thing we can do is we can say y equals, and we have like mx plus b for, um, for the value of a line. So if we said y equals 3x plus 7. Oh, we have to do 3 times x. <laughs> it doesn't know what we want if we just do value. Okay, so, so 3 times 15, that's 45, plus 7 is 52. So, um, so we can have other variables as well. Now, so far, all we've seen is numbers, and when we did this divide, all of a sudden it tacked on this point zero. That's because there's different types of numbers, and this is again something you probably touched on way, way back in like middle school. Um, and if you haven't kept up with math, you may have forgotten, but um, so there's integers, there's whole numbers, and there's rational numbers, there's irrational numbers, and there's even imaginary numbers. Um, so just to go over those, um, whole numbers are those numbers that don't have a decimal point and are greater than zero. So one, two, three, four, five, and so on. Integers are all of the whole numbers plus zero and negative numbers. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 are also integers, uh, but 0 is also an integer, and negative 5 is an integer, and 37, and negative 37. Anything without a decimal point, what positive or negative or 0, those are all integers. Now, um, rational numbers can have a decimal point. So, um, so like 5.3 is a rational number. Uh, you can also express those as um, a numerator and a denominator, so a fraction. Um, so like 5 over 3, right? Um, irrational numbers cannot be expressed in their entirety with a de decimal point. Um, so like pi, right? Pi is irrational. And it can be expressed as a fraction because it's um, circumference over diameter. But uh, when you actually try to calculate that, um, it just goes on and on forever and like in the decimals. So you, it's like 3.14159265535, blah, 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 blah. Um, and then imaginary numbers just have the I <laughs> in them somewhere. Um, we won't go into all that. but. The important thing to understand is that there's different types of numbers and computers need different ways of representing numbers using different data types. So when we do a divide, Python's converting the number from an integer, like one, five, six, or whatever of these numbers, and it converts it to a rational number that has a decimal point. And the reason it's doing that is you might have a remainder. And we can actually ask for what the remainder is. There's an operator called the modulo operator. So uh, the percent sign is the modulo operator. And what it says is take the first number divided by the second number and give me the remainder. So in this case, it'll be 2 because 5 divided by 3 is 1, and then you say 5 minus 3 is 2. 2 doesn't evenly divide into 5, so 2 is the remainder. So there it is. And if we did you know, 10 mod 3, that's 1, because 10 divided by 3 is 3. 3 times 3 is 9. 10 minus 9 is 1. Um, we could do like 8 
mod 7, 1, um, 15, mod 7, let's see, 9, mod 4, um, picking all numbers that, 9, mod 2, <laughs> uh, let's see, 9, mod 8. Just do a big number. Mod eight. Okay, so that there, there's one without one. Um, eight hundred and eighty. Okay. Um, now the remainder is always going to be an integer, so there's no reason for Python to spit out a decimal point along with that, um, because like by definition, the remainder is an integer. Um, and the fractional part would be the remainder over the, uh, is that the divisor, I think, um, or the dividend, I can't remember which of those two it is. Okay, so we've talked about some different numbers as data types, but we can also have um, other types of data as well, such as um, strings. A string is a sequence of characters. So a character is any alphanumeric character, like any of the letters or numbers, anything like that. So I could say like stir equals uh, introduction to Python. Now if I go stir, it says introduction to Python. Um, so stir is a sequence of characters or a string of characters. Now we can do mathematical operations on numbers, but what happens if we try and do math on a string? So let's do ing equals this is fun. Okay, so what do we do plus ing? So introduction to Python, this is fun. So it didn't mathematically combine them the way, you know, 100 plus 30, 354 is 454. It didn't like line them up into rows and add them. Instead, it did what's called concatenation. So it took the first string and it tacked on the second string at the end of it. Um, and that's just the way Python is constructed. It's just the way it does it. So if we did like str, let's say, five equals str five plus one. Okay, so Python actually throws an error and it says, oh, we can't concatenate um, an int or, or we can't like, this command just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, in some languages, if you were to do that, they're set up to actually increment the letter. So like the O would become a P. <laughs> um, so Python is, does not do that. It just throws out an error. Okay, so we've got numbers, we've got strings, we've got characters. Um, and we've talked about some data. So those are some different types of data that we can store in variables. There's all different other types of variables as well. Basically, we could create our own data structures and use a variable to refer to them. We're not going to go through that in this discussion, but understand, like, if you wanted to, you could make your own data structure, your own thing that has a set of, say, numbers or strings. Like, if you wanted to represent a person, you could create a class, a person class. And what that is, is any time you create an object or a, a variable that points to that type of data, you could say, well, this person, it, they have a name, they have a birthday, they have a height, they have a weight, um, and, you know, they have a social security number, <laughs> whatever other data you might want to give them. Um, and you can store those different values in each of those variables. And then you'd be able to access them and you'd be able to uh, retrieve them and store them. You'd be able to do mathematical operations on them, whatever you wanted to do. Um, 
So we're not going to go through that today, but just know that that's another way you can use variables is to refer to those types of things. So now, now we're going to talk about conditional statements. A conditional statement is basically uh, you ask, is this thing true or false? And only do what I tell you to do next if it's true. So for example, let's say age equals, or let's say um, alcohol age limit equals 21. Okay, so we'll go alcohol age limit 21. Okay, so we'll say person age equals 18. Now we'll say if person age greater than alcohol age limit. Now, what we're saying uh, is if the person's age is greater than the alcohol age limit, then say can buy beer. So we hit enter and it basically nothing happens. Um, no, it's, so what just happened is we said if, and then we gave our condition, person age is greater than alcohol age limit, then you then just say you can buy beer. But in reality, what's going on, that person age we said is 18, alcohol age limit is 21. Well, 18 is not greater than 21, so nothing happens. So let's change this a little bit and we'll say if it's less than, then you can say can not buy beer. So we hit enter and it says cannot buy beer. That's because 18 is in fact less than 21. Um, and so it evaluates the next statement and it says, yep, you can't buy beer, you're too young. Um, and we could do it that way instead too. We could say too young, too young. <laughs> so, um, so there's all sorts of different conditions. There's all sorts of different uh, times you want to use conditional statements. Um, obviously not just for checking if somebody can buy beer. Um, but if you're making a game, for example, um, you might say, well, if this person is on the ground, then they can jump. And so then if you get input and for the you know jump, then you would actually like shoot the person up into the air and have them jump. And if they weren't on the ground, then you just wouldn't do anything. You wouldn't change their velocity unless maybe you're doing like a double jump or something. So, so that's conditionals. You're just basically checking is something true? If it is true, do what I'm telling you to do in that case. Otherwise, just don't. Um, so, the next thing is loops. So, in video game programming, there's kind of a constant loop that's always going on. Um, and it's just like at 60 frames per second or whatever. It's checking, what do you want me to do right now? What do you want me to do right now? Um, putting that to the side though, we can do loops for so all sorts of other things in programming generally. So for example, um, if we wanted to, like we were talking about the, um, the equation for a line, right? We might say, let's say I wanna know um, what the different values of y are for x from negative 10 to 10. Um, so, or maybe just zero to 10. So in Python, we can use what's called a for loop. So we're gonna say i in range 10, um, we'll say, i times 3 plus 5. So i is our, well, we can say x for x in range. And x times 3 plus 5. So this is our line equation. Now, 
this is saying x is a variable and range this is just a word that says um, from 0 to this number whatever this number is in these parentheses so in this case it's 10 so for all of the numbers from 0 to 10 show me x times 3 plus 5 okay so so we start at 1 or I guess we start at 0 we go 0 times 3 plus 5 is 5 1 times 3 plus 5 is 8 2 times 3 is 6 plus 5 is 11 3 times 3 is 9 plus 5 is 14 and so on so this shows us all of the different points of our line um, from 0 to 9 because it's 0 to 9 then it's it says x this is actually read as for x between um, 0 and 10 but exclusive exclusive of this number so strictly less than so 9 times 3 is 27 plus 5 is 32 so that's the last number and then it just goes back so anytime we have like a collection of data where it's um, it's a collection of, like for all of the people in this area or whatever um, we can do a loop to go through each of them to iterate through each of them um, so that's another concept in programming so now let's talk about functions so so far what we've been doing is just one instruction at a time um, or like in this case it's a series of instructions but we can write it as basically one instruction on one line so um, a function is sort of like um, a line or I'm sorry like in math right um, the definition of a line which is y equals mx m times x plus b that I keep using as an example well this we can also say f of x equals that so y is f of x and the way we would do that in Python is to say def line x okay and then what we would do is we could say m equals 3 b equals 5 and then we turn 3 times x or m times x plus b so now we have a definition of our line it's got the slope and the intercept m and b and we just say return and so what does that mean well return means if you see this function this is the value that you give back to whatever calls the function so if we were to say for x in range 10, line x. Um, and now that we're in, when we have a separate file, we actually have to say print. So print line x. All right. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to say quit. And then we'll do Python 3. So when we were just working straight with Python over here, uh, we could just give it one instruction at a time and it would just go through. Over here, what we're doing is we actually wrote um, a program and then we had to tell Python execute that program. So test.py. That's our program, Python 3. This is calling Python um, much the same way I did up here. This is just saying, okay, execute the program that's in this file. And it does exactly the same thing as what we did when we said for x in range 10, 3 plus 5, x times 3 plus 5. It's the exact same thing. The difference is um, we defined a function. So def means, hey, I'm going to make a function now. And then under it, this is like 
what instructions I want you to perform when I call this function. So we say give m the value of 3, give b the value of 5, and then return m times x plus b. So then down here we say for x in range 10, which is exactly what we did here, and instead of saying x times 3 equals 5, or x times 3 plus 5, then we say print, which means make it appear on the screen, and then we say line x. And what this is doing is saying, okay, this line parentheses x, that's a function. And it says, whatever this is, I don't know exactly what to do with this, but it must be defined somewhere. And then it goes and looks and it says, oh, here's the definition of what that is. There's a definition for line x and it says, here's three steps. So it sets m equal to three, b equal to five, and then it returns m times x plus b. So this whole thing would be, it would go, okay, so x in range 10, so start with zero. So print line zero. So zero comes up here and it says m equals three, b equals five, return uh, three times zero plus five. So that'll do five. Then it would be one for, so after zero is in range 10. So one in range 10, print line one, one times three plus five. So that's six or eight. So one times three is uh, three plus five is eight. And then it does that for two. Two times three is six plus five is 11. Uh, three times three is nine plus five is 14 and so on. And we can have much more complicated functions than just a line. So for example, um, there's a function for the greatest common factor of two numbers. So the greatest common factor uh, of two numbers, um, you can actually figure out by saying, so def we'll just say, so the greatest common factor of two numbers is the biggest number that will evenly divide into those two numbers. So we'll go m, n. Now, I'm not gonna go through the proof of exactly how this works. You can look at that up on your own if you want. Um, but basically, what we do is we say, the remainder of this r equals m, mod n. Remember we talked about that earlier, the modulo operator. So r is our remainder. I can actually just write that out. Remainder equals that. Now, the formula for this is if remainder equals zero. Now, remember, if we say x equals, that's telling Python, hey, store this value into x. When we're doing comparisons, we can't use a single equals because it would store it. We've already stored a value that we want. So instead, in conditionals in programming, we use two equals signs. Um, that means compare, don't store. So if remainder equals zero, then we return n. What that means is n is in fact the greatest common factor for m and n. Why? Well, we took m, and this is assuming that m is bigger than or equal to n, this function. So if we take m and we divide it by n and get a remainder of zero, then we know that n is the biggest number that evenly divides both m and n. Um, otherwise, so this is another thing we can do with conditionals is we can say if that, and we could say um, if remainder not equal zero, right? But instead of doing that, we are provided with the else keyword. So if that's not true, then do this other thing. 
And in this case, what we do is we return n, uh, whoops, gcf n par remainder. So what this is doing, we have a function gcf, greatest common factor, and it does this. And if the remainder equals zero, then we just return n. But if it's not that, we actually call the function that we're in again. <laughs> we just call it with different input. Instead of m and n, we pass in n remainder. And so what happens is this n is treated as the m, this remainder is treated as n, and there's a new instance of this function that is now executed. And so it's going to take n divided by the remainder, calculate a new remainder, say if that new remainder is equal to zero, then return our old remainder. Otherwise, it's going to call this yet again. <laughs> so it's going to keep doing this until it finds some number that evenly divides m and n. And it might get all the way to the remainder is 1, in which case the greatest common factor is just 1. There's no other number that evenly divides the two numbers. So. Let's see how this works. So we can do for, um, well, we can just do print GCF. Let's do uh, 21, uh, let's do, um, yeah, 21 and 14, okay? So if we do that, Seven. Okay, so let's see what happened here. So we took 21 divided by 14. Um, let's actually just write this out. So uh, let's see if we can do, can we do that? No. Um, all right, that's fine. We'll just write it out. So GCF. Oh yeah, here's how we do it. Okay, so so we call GCF on 21. 14. So what actually happens? Well, we say remainder equals um, 21 mod 14. So what is that? So it's 21 divided by 14 would be 1. Um, and then so uh, 21 over 14 equals 1 remainder 7. So 7 is the remainder. And so then we would get here and say, if remainder equals zero, well, no, it's not zero. So then it'll call greatest common factor. So it'll call GCF on 14, seven. So this is the new instance. So then we would say remainder equals 14 mod 7. Well, 14 divided by 7 is 2 remainder 0. So here it would say remainder equals 0 and return n. So it returns 7. So then that goes back to the original instance here, and it says return GCF of n remainder. So this is 14, this is 7. We just said that outcome is um, 7, because that's this. So therefore, it outputs 7. And that's true of just any two numbers that we might um, do this with. So we might say, you know, 150. So 50, right? Because 50 evenly divides into 100. We did 52, 4. So, so this is a function. Uh, functions generally return some value. Um, you can have functions that don't return values, but they're typically associated with 
some other data structure that has like internal state stuff. So you call that function as a way of manipulating the internal state. So here's another function. And by the way, uh, this act of <clears throat> um, having a function that calls itself, this is called recursion. So there's a really famous recursive problem called the Fibonacci sequence. So the Fibonacci sequence is like 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, on and on and on. The pattern there is whatever sequence number you're interested in, the, the ith sequ uh, value in the sequence, you take, um, so like Fibonacci of i, basically you return Fibonacci i minus 1 plus Fibonacci of i minus 2. Um, with the exception being, if i equals 0, return 1, l, if. So this is, oops, um, okay, so the first two numbers, the zeroth and the first numbers are 1 in the sequence. So if i is 0, you return 1. If i is 1, you return 1. Otherwise, you return um, i minus 1 plus i minus 2. Um, and actually, I'm going to do it backwards like this. So like the second one would be 0 plus 1, or 1 plus 1. Uh, the third one is, so that's 2. Then the next one, here, let me just put it down here. So we'll go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then, so those are i's. And then this is 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8. So these two numbers add up to that. 2 plus 1 is 3. 3 plus 2 is 5. 5 plus 3 is 8, and so on. So let's say we wanted to know what are the first 100 Fibonacci numbers. So we're just going to do 4i in range 100. Okay, Fibonacci of i. Okay, so now, so it spits out 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55, and then it's still working, it's still going, but it's really taken a long time <laughs> to get to the next number. And the issue here is that we've told the computer what we want, this, and that is the correct definition of the Fibonacci sequence, but something's going wrong. Something's happening that is like, man, this is really, really slow. There's got to be a way to make this go faster, right? And it turns out um, this is a big part of programming or computer science generally is when we analyze how to do something in code uh, or in programming, sometimes there's a much better way to do it. So right now, our question is, well, why is this running so slow? And I'm gonna just kill that before it overloads my computer. So if we look at this and we say, why is this running so slow? I mean, this is the right mathematical definition. Um, what's going on? Well, if we think about, if we look at, say, uh, say Fibonacci of 30. So what that is, is actually Fib of 28 plus Fib oops, of 29. But then what is that? Well, that's Fib of 26 plus Fib 27 
so that's fib 28 plus fib 27 plus fib 28. So we come here and we say, okay, well, I want to get fib 28. In order to get fib 28, I need to do this. Oops, not fib it. And then to do 26, I have to do 24 plus 25. And then to do 27, I do 25 plus 26. So it does all this work to do 30, 20, 9, 28, 27, 26, 25, 24, 23, 22, 23, all the way down to 1 to get fib of 28. Then it goes to fib 29, and it does all of this work again plus one more. So every time it's doubling the amount of work it has to do. Um, so that means it's executing all these instructions, figuring out all these values, and then, um, you know, doing all of that all over again every single time. So we can see, though, in order to get 29, 29 depends on 28, which was calculated right here. Well, there's got to be a better way to do this then, right? So there's sort of two ways to make this better. So this way is really, really slow. So we're just going to kill this. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, um, we're going to have fib1 equals 1, fib2 equals 1, for um, x in range i. We're going to do fib2, or we're going to say uh, temp equals fib1 plus fib2, and we're going to say um, fib1 equals fib2, fib2 equals 10. All right, now you might be wondering what in the heck is all that? And so min return fib2. So in order to do the Fibonacci sequence, like first of all, if it's zero, then we just return one. If it's one, then we return one. Otherwise, what we're doing, again, consider, you know, we've got zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then this is, whoops, one, one, two, three, five, eight, uh, 13, 21, 34. Okay, so let's just kind of go through this. So for the first one, um, so for say two, it's one plus one. So what that is, is fib one plus fib two, and that's our full range, is just in range two. Um, oh, actually, that worked. All right. Might have to think about that. <laughs> um, but, oh, here we go. Uh, So we say fib one is one, fib two is one, so one plus one gives us two. For number three, we would say fib one plus 
that two equals one plus one. So then, so that's ten. But then we do fib one equals fib two. So that's one equals one. And then fib two equals ten. So ultimately, so this is one and this is two. see let's just do So this is the value that's returned is two here. So let's go through four, four, fib one plus fib two equals one plus one, and that's 10. And then fib one equals fib two equals one. Two equals ten equals two. But then it's going to execute again. So then it's going to go ten equals one plus two because fib one plus fib two. Then fib one equals fib two equals uh, two. equals 10 equals 3. So then it returns 3. So 1, 1, 2, 3. So hopefully you can kind of see what's going on. Basically the values are being shifted. So it's like fib1 is here, fib2 is here, and then fib1 plus fib2 is here. So it's 1, 1, 2. And so if fib1 were 5 and fib2 were 8, then 10th equals 13. Uh, then fib1 becomes 8, fib2 becomes 13, and then it's ready to make 21. So it's just like these two numbers keep kind of sliding down this line. All right, so now if we wanted to calculate 100 values, remember just how slow this was. Well, let's see what happens now. Well, it's almost instant. We, we just get them all. Um, and so you can see uh, it's, it's having to redo all the work every time as this increments, but it can go through this whole thing much, much faster because we're basically sort of storing, we're like using the data we already have, not going back and recalculating it every single time. Now there's one more technique that we could do to make this go even faster. Now you can see like if we run this, you, it's barely perceptible just how fast it is, but there's a way we can make it go even faster. So we can say a equals, uh, whoops, we can, yeah, go like that. this is going to do, this is what's called an array. And so remember when I just had this is like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Um, and then we had like 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8. So if we think of this as segments of memory, so the first value in memory, the second value in memory, and so on, and this is the actual values, 
an array works just like this. So it's basically a of 0 is 1, a of 1 is 2, a of 2 er, is 1, a of 2 is 2, a of 3 is 3, a of 4 is 5, a of 5 is 8. Um, so we store the values uh, in this array. So, um, so now at first, we don't, um, we don't know what the value actually is. So we're just going to initialize it to negative 1. And I'll show you why we're doing that in just a second. Um, but what we're going to do here is as we discover the values of the Fibonacci sequence, we're going to store them into this array. So <clears throat> we're going to say that and a. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to say if a, uh, a of i. So this is saying if the ith entry in this array is greater than 0, return a i. OK? Else if i equals 0, we're going to say a i equals 1 and return 1. Else if a i, or I equals 1, a i equals 1, return 1. Else, what we're going to do is we're going to go back to the recursive um, technique, and we're going to say a i equals Fibonacci i minus i minus minus 2 a plus Fibonacci i minus 1 a. Actually, we can just do this. Well, I'll keep it like that. We can go like this. Let me do one other change. We'll just do like this, like this this whole thing be if ai is less than 0 then we'll do this 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 and then we'll do return ai okay okay so what's going on here so we've got this array which just stores a sequence of values. And so it's got a zeroth value, a first value, a second value, a third value, on and on and on. We tell it at the beginning, so this happens before this. So at first, we just initialize all those values to negative one. Now we're gonna go for zero to, or for, yeah, zero up to 100. We're gonna output the Fibonacci sequence, or the Fibonacci number for that value. And, whoops, and we have to pass it A. So we have to give it A because it says I and A. Okay, so it says if the array value is less than zero, so if it hasn't been calculated yet, then if I is equal to zero, store AI is one, or if I is equal to one, then AI equals one. Otherwise, AI equals Fibonacci of I minus two, plus Fibonacci i minus 1, and we give it a in both cases. Then return a i. So basically, we're returning the value um, of uh, the ith value in the array, which we just set here. OK, so remember how slow it was the first time. Um, Let's see what a 
save our append. Here we go. I think we can do that. There we go. Okay. <laughs> I forgot exactly how, I can never remember how arrays work in Python the first time, but okay. So now that isn't that much faster that we can see um, because the whole printing process and everything, it's just so, so fast. Uh, but if you were to measure these two techniques, this one is actually about a hundred times faster than the looping technique that we did. Um, so that's pretty impressive. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, this is what programmers have to do is use these tools to problem solve. So when, so, um, so what we just did was we tried a recursive solution like a naive recursive solution and realized it didn't work. So then we had to go back to the drawing board and say, well, instead of recursion, let's try a loop and the loop worked. But then the reason the loop worked was because we were storing the data. So then we used, this is a technique called uh, memoization. So we used that technique to make an even better recursive solution. Um, and so that's just a big part of programming is using these tools to come up with creative solutions to problems um, and then and making them work and making them fast. So anyway, so that's just some of the things we do in programming. Um, and as you can see, I'm not going to take out the parts where I made errors because that's just part of this. Um, when you're programming, you're going to run into errors. You're going to do things that just don't work. And you know what? That's okay. Then you just have to like go back and look. How do I do this in this language? Oh yeah, right. Uh, I, you know, in some languages you create the entire array up front. In other languages like Python, it's created dynamically. So we just had to do it a little bit different. Um, just to walk you through what this is. So A is an array or a list is what this is calling it. And then we say append, so add to the end, negative one. So it does that a hundred times. Um, and then up here, we're just changing that negative one value to the actual value um, of the Fibonacci sequence. So once we've calculated, say, say we're doing 50, right? Um, so if we're up to 50, then we will have already calculated 48 and 49. So this will say, well, give me the value of 48. So it calls Fibonacci of 48. And this says if A of I is less than zero, well, it won't be. It'll just give you the 48th value. And this will give you the 49th value. And because we're going in order, that'll already be done. So the, the 50th value will just be these two values that are stored in this array. So um, anyway, I hope this is helpful in as you begin your programming journey. Um, and so it's good to explore these different techniques uh, and see how to do them in your language of choice, whether that's C++ for Unreal, whether that's C Sharp for Unity, uh, Godot or GD Script for Godot, um, or C sharp for Godot. Uh, just go and look and see how to do these techniques in those languages um, and just kind of explore them. So thanks for watching. I hope this is helpful and I'll see you in the next one.